Hello and welcome to this special broadcast. I'm Ashmit Kumar. Now, the increasing legal wranglings between the opposition state governments and the central government over several issues has the Supreme Court worried. Today, while hearing a petition filed by the Congress-led Karnataka government, the court observed that there should not be a contest between the states and the center. The apex court stopped short of issuing a notice uh, to the center and asked both sides to resolve the issue amicably. But this is not the only instance of a state government at loggerheads with the centre. The DMK-led Tamil Nadu government has also moved the Supreme Court seeking disaster relief. In another case, the Tamil Nadu government uh, moved the court against the state's governor who administered the oath of office uh, to a minister only after a sharp rebuke by the apex court. The CPM-led Kerala government had also moved the apex court over its borrowing limits. Uh, those cases, that case specifically, the one with Kerala, has now been referred to a constitution bench. Joining me now to discuss the tension on centre versus state relations, especially in southern India, is senior advocate Mahesh Jaitmilani, also a nominated Rajya Sabha MP. Uh, Mr. Jaitmilani, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your time. First question, uh, the concern that has been raised by the Karnataka government as well as the Tamil Nadu government is that disaster relief stretching up to almost 50,000 crore rupees. That's the combined demand. 18,000 crore rupees for Karnataka, around 39,000 crore rupees uh, for the Tamil Nadu government. There is no action being taken by the center and they felt the need to move the apex court. Is there a trust deficit here? Well, I don't know. Look, I, 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 the matter was in court today. And uh, from what I gather, the Honorable Solicitor General said that instead of moving court, they should have taken it up with the, with the center and tried to do exactly what the court suggested, i.e. resolve it amicably instead of making it a matter of a legal dispute before, a country, before the Supreme Court. So, uh, you know, uh, that if, if, if the Karnataka government had not taken that step, uh, as the Solicitor General uh, affirmed, and uh, what the courts recommended, the two-judge bench recommended it should be, if it hasn't done so already, uh, then perhaps that's the best way to resolve the dispute. I mean, you know, I don't think the center is going to risk the unpopularity of uh, 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 of uh, the, the releasing funds which are due to the state for, you know, disaster management, drought in the case of uh, uh, the Karnataka government. And not only a question of popularity, but I think it makes for good central, uh, you know, federal center-state relationships, uh, uh, you know, for mm -hmm. the smooth functioning and to avoid these... Uh, Contest. It also creates a very bad, a very bad optics that if if uh, the centre is to uh, withhold funds which are due to a state government. But I, having said that, I don't know if that's the case in any of the cases which are pending uh, uh, pertaining to non-release sure. of funds by the centre to the concerned states. You mentioned Kerala, and I believe there's also something to do with uh, Punjab if I'm not mistaken. Fair point, uh, Mr. Jaitmanani, but let me come back to you on the observation that Justice Gawai made today. He said that he's concerned with light of these various cases that are coming uh, to the top court. So this comes in context of the Kerala government with the borrowing limit. Uh, they were seeking immediate borrowing of about 26,000 crore rupees. That case has now been referred to a five-judge bench. These cases, of course, are also yet to be decided. A response is sought from the centre in two weeks' time. Does this entire exercise uh, perhaps reduce the effort, uh, the fiscal efforts of the state governments uh, for any relief measures that they may be willing to undertake? Uh, does this discord between the centre and the states come in the way? See, look, you, you know, actually, when it comes to a question of discretionary funds, if you are asking for grants and aid or loans from the centre, right? I mean, there's a recent case of the Delhi Jal Board, the Water Board of Delhi, right, where they're doing the same thing. Now, if states have been profligate, if you indulge in freebies, for instance, right, and you are not able to generate your own revenues uh, for even even the basic management of you know uh, administrative ex uh, expenses, then the centre may be, may have a case that those listen. You give freebies, you are not able to generate any funds to sustain uh, you know autonomous mm -hmm. organisations dealing with individual matters like drought relief. Or in the case of Delhi, the, the water board uh, dealing with uh, you know. Uh, uh, water supply and water sanitation. So if you're not able to do it, then there's a case. So what is the pending issue? I mean, it all depends. Loans and grants in aid, right, cannot be given for the asking. Right? There has to be a strong need for it. And also, 
the the uh, conduct of the state government on the question of fiscal prudence uh, is a consideration which the center will take into account or ought to take into account. In fact, those were some of the similar. Right, Mr. Jait Milani, those were some of the arguments that the Solicitor General had said that there needs to be some amount of fiscal responsibility. But while that argument may apply to the state of Kerala, which has exceeded its debt limit, uh, states like Karnataka, states like Tamil Nadu, very heavily industrialized, uh, very good on their revenue front. Uh, ev even states like these have voiced their concern. The common thread that many are beginning to see is that all of these states which are voicing concerns, so whether that's Punjab, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, Karnataka, are ruled by the opposition. Is there something to be read with respect to the conduct of the center vis-a-vis -vis these states, opposition rule states? So if, if you are telling, if, 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 the, if the implicit suggestion is that, is that the uh, center is deliberately withholding funds merely because the states who are uh, making these uh, demands are opposition rule states, then I think that you know, unless there is strong evidence to suggest that, there is, that the center has no case and these must be released corporate and the center is either dragging its feet deliberately or turning its face to these demands for reasons of political expediency. Right. Uh, you know, that, I, I, it's something that I find extremely difficult to believe because uh, the, the government would come into, the central government would not risk uh, losing and uh, alienating the people of the state's con 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 concern. I think the people of the states are far more important and, and their, uh, their welfare, uh, their, you know, their protection from disaster management, uh, from, from disasters, is a far more important uh, issue. It's a, you know, either you either you believe that uh, the center, the cent those who rule the center, are narrow, you know, deal in narrow political prejudice, right? Or they are statesmanlike. I do not believe that the government of the center right, would pay, play petty politics in matters such as sure. disaster relief. Sure. Uh, let me also draw in the issue of the tensions that we've seen, not just between the center and the states, but also uh, the governor and the elected assemblies. Uh, the most recent example of the Tamil Nadu government wanting to reinstate K. Panmudi as a minister, the governor not obliging, the Supreme Court having to intervene, and then coming out with some very, very strongly uh, worded observations against the governor and the conduct of the governor. This is not in isolation. We've seen similar conduct of the governor, perhaps not exceeding uh, to bills passed by the Assembly, Karnataka, Kerala, uh, the Tamil Nadu government have raised these concerns. Is this perhaps an extension of this trust deficit that exists, that even the governor and the state administration, the state government are not able to see eye to eye, the governor not acceding to the requests and the actions of the state assemblies? Yeah, I, you know, Ashpit, uh, since, since really uh, the governor is a representative of the central government, in a concerned state, right? There is, there is some, or there is always some. It is impossible for a governor, right? No matter how impartial he strives to be, right? Uh, to maintain optimal, to maintain an optimal degree of, uh, you know, uh, impartiality. But having said that, uh, the, the, the misuse of the, gubernatorial, the uh, gubernatorial office uh, is as old as the hills. It's been happening since times immemorial. So there will be cases where there will be some cases. I don't want to give specific instances because on specific instances, I'm not qualified enough with the information necessary to make those inferences. Right? So there may be cases where, where there have been excesses of jurisdiction and, you know, uh, even, even political motives. I, I don't know. But one has to go on a case-by-case -case approach. And what the facts are in a given case the fact that the Supreme Court has come down heavily, of course, is something which has to be paid the highest respect to. One has to bow to the Supreme Court's observations and, and, and say, without being, uh, you know, uh, partisan, that, that sure. if the Supreme Court has so found, then we are bound by those findings. Sure. Uh, let me come back to you for one final question, that as far as uh, this issue is concerned, the observations that fell from the apex court, whether with respect to the governor or today with respect uh, to the center state relations, uh, there is, uh, it is, the observation is in the direction of hinting at perhaps a constitutional breakdown. As a jurist, what would your assessment be of the situation where increasingly 
Uh, we are seeing these cases of the state assemblies agitating against the elected, against the governor appointed by the center, agitating against the center for non-grant, non-release of funds. Uh, is the court the right fora for deciding these issues? Uh, if not, then what is the way forward? Well, I mean, if there is a breakdown of relations between uh, go governor and uh, elected representatives of a state, right, ultimately you need somebody to mediate. And the best person to mediate, the best institution to mediate is the Supreme Court. Uh, if, a, if a state feels it has no other choice, then it, it has the... It has the right and indeed the, the court has the jurisdiction to entertain such uh, differences and try and resolve them. Uh, if it finds that the uh, uh, you know, conduct of any party to the dispute is excessive right, and unconstitutional, it is the duty of the court, right, in uh, rem remembering that, for instance, that the governor or a chief minister right, are all you know, occupying right. high constitutional positions, right, to, to, uh, to gently reprimand whoever is wrong. I don't see anything wrong in that, that at all. That's what the courts are for. They're, they're there to prevent abuse of power, no matter how high uh, a dignitary may be. Sure. Right, Mr. Jait Milani, appreciate you joining us and sharing your insight with us. With that, we're heading into a very short break, but on the other side, we continue this conversation on this tension uh, that is being seen between the central government and the state governments and what that will translate into fiscal terms. We'll come back in just a bit. Welcome back. I'm now joined by senior advocates, uh, Mr. Sanjay Hegde, Mr. Gopal Jain, as well as Mr. Sanjoy Ghosh. We are discussing uh, the tensions that are being witnessed between the central government as well as the state governments. There's a uh, case was filed today by Karnataka High Court. It was heard today by Justice Gawai led bench. Justice Gawai expressing concern as to why a state government, a state like Karnataka, is having to move the top court of the country uh, to seek disaster relief funds for 18,000 crore rupees. This comes on the back of a similar petition having been filed by Tamil Nadu. Tamil Nadu government is seeking as much as 40,000 crore rupees. Uh, the Kerala government has moved the top court as well. The first case of its kind, this one on the issue of the borrowing cap. The Kerala government is seeking about 26,000 crore rupees. So very large numbers we're discussing here. Uh, we're discussing the rights of the individual states versus the rights of the central government. Uh, let's dive straight in. Mr. Sanjay Hegde, let me come to you first. Uh, a lot of concern being expressed here by the Apex Court, and this concern coming in light of various cases, state governments expressing frustration with the center, and that frustration resulting in uh, an appeal before the top court of the country. Yes, uh, there always has been uh, a situation where states feel that the center is not paying up or not paying adequately. I remember nearly 20 years ago uh, when uh, Mr. S.M. Krishna, then Chief Minister of Karnataka, said that of every 100 rupees that we send to the center, we get back about 17, uh, 17 rupees. Uh, if now after GST, uh, most of the states have uh, their avenues of taxation greatly reduced. It has to be, uh, funds have to come in from the center expeditiously. The center often plays uh, favorites or uh, delays payments. And it is here that some kind of mechanism has to be evolved. After all, the center in a quasi-federal structure is the pivot around everything that uh, works. If the center decides to de uh, delay or play favorites or disfavors anyone, what is the remedy? And that's why most many so, of these states have approached the Supreme Court. And uh, I was listening into what uh, my state Mulani said. Uh, I am afraid that I do not share his optimism about the center being fair always. Uh, today it is this government, tomorrow it may be another government. What has to be done is that there should be institutionalized uh, mechanisms which ensure that payments which are due are uh, speedily dispersed. And if they are not dispersed, there are uh, sure. uh, financial uh, uh, penalties. Sure. 
Uh, let me take that up with Mr. Ghosh. Mr. Ghosh, I was reading through the petition that has been filed by the Karnataka government as well as the Tamil Nadu government. What those petitions seems to allege and indicate is that there is a discriminatory behavior. Uh, to the layman, when one sees the state of Kerala, the state of Tamil Nadu, the state of Karnataka, as well as the state of Punjab moving against either the governor, which is appointed by the centre, or directly against the central government, is there something to be said about the composition of these states, the fact that they happen to be opposition rule states? Is that something that contributes to the understanding and the claim that there is a discriminatory behaviour being done by the centre with opposition rule states? Well, Ashwamit, you're bang on point. In fact, when you said it's a South Indian issue, it's not a South Indian issue. It's actually an opposition issue. You will remember that the state of Punjab almost had a constitutional crisis because the governor refused to call the session of the assembly to pass the budget. And only because he was having a Twitter spat with the chief minister. So you've had issues where in, uh, in Tamil Nadu, the governor refused to read the governor's address to the assembly, which is actually everyone knows is the statement of the ruling executive government. It's not his own personal statement that he reads. And unfortunately, you see, no one will tell you the elephant in the room is this. The elephant in the room is that you know how uh, the relations between the then West Bengal governor and the chief minister was. And ultimately, this person was rewarded with the high post of vice president. So I feel in a lighter way, now every governor is competing that the more obnoxious I will behave with the elected government, maybe I will have a good political future ahead, uh, ahead of me. So that is why we beat Kerala, where you see the spat happening, where we, uh, Punjab, uh, uh, Karnataka, in Tamil Nadu, in Bengal, it's everywhere. In Delhi, you see what has happened. Of course, there not only the left-wing governor, but you also have the central government uh, amending the, uh, uh, the act, and uh, which, uh, which was interpreted by the constitution bench in favor of an elected government. And it is very sad, Ashmit, because in 2014, finally, we had great expectations that a chief minister who has ruled for so many years, who has faced discrimination at the hands of center, promised that now he will take the perspective of the state to the, to the center. He will rule with the sensitivity that there are states who feel discriminated, who feel that they need uh, attention from the, uh, sure. from the central government, which gives a stepmotherly treatment uh, to the states. And what we have seen, unfortunately, in the last 10 years is, is indeed very, very tragic. Right. Mr. Gopal Jain is also joining us. Uh, Mr. Jain, thank you so much for being a part of this discussion. Uh, the first question I want to ask you is uh, that today when these proceedings began before the uh, Supreme Court, Justice Govai uh, made his observation that he's concerned. The Solicitor General responded to that by saying that uh, they should have come to us first. They should have come to the centre first. Why are they approaching the court? The very fact that they've moved the court, and this is not an isolated incident, southern states of Kerala, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu have all moved uh, the apex court. Does that hint at perhaps a constitutional breakdown, perhaps uh, uh, the federal rights not being respected? That's the concern, that's the claim being raised before the top court. Do you share that concern? So let us put it in perspective that public finance as well as financial matters or economic matters impact the whole country. And therefore, the first step is to have a very effective regulatory structure or mechanism with established principles on the basis of which these issues are decided. This will immediately make sure that there is fair treatment and objective criteria. Number two, though the matter has gone to court, perhaps as a first instance, it would have been better to petition this high-level committee or the existing institutional structure with documented evidence to show that what you're seeking is in line with the ask and whatever are the extant and applicable rules or provisions. Three, sometimes in matters of economic interest, courts always yield to the opinion of experts because courts don't consider themselves to be experts. So when there is a dispute, matters do go to court, but often courts itself send it to expert bodies. So very much like you have finance commissions, maybe there should be a standing existing mechanism which can address these issues of public finance as well as issues of fiscal management. And sometimes, as you know, states also do extra borrowing or sometimes they ask for funds which may not necessarily have a legitimate basis. So these are matters which should be looked at from a very holistic but economic and financial lens and always best left in the hands of experts, including independent experts, perhaps sometimes the former governor of the RBI 
as an example, people who have a good macroeconomic insight into this so that we don't have this impasse or stalemate. And lastly, there should be a time-bound basis on which these decisions should be taken so that they serve the purpose for which these funds have been sought. Understood. Uh, let me take that across uh... Uh, to, in fact, uh, Mr. Sanjay Hegde as well. Uh, Mr. Hegde, I'll just borrow from what Mah Mr. Mahesh Jait Milani uh, sh thoughts he shared with us. He said that uh, it would not be in the interest of the central government uh, to delay the release of these funds as that will hurt their own prospects in those respective states. Is that an argument that holds water when we're looking at a number of opposition ruled states uh, raising concerns with respect to release of funds, with respect to uh, bills being approved by the governors. Is that an argument that holds water? One minute. I'm sorry. Can you hear me Mr. now? Mr. Higde, I believe you're on mute. Yes. yes. Uh, theoretically... Crystal, uh, go ahead, Mr. Higde. Theoretically, it may hold water. But as uh, Lord Keynes said, in the long run, we are all dead. The... I, the thing is that if the center delays crucial funds, especially in and around election time, then there are consequences. Whether the public at large says that, look, it is the center which is not paying up and therefore we shall take our anger out on the party ruling at the center or whether take the, take the anger to the state's concern, they, uh, we, we do not know. Uh, the real thing is that there should not be an incentive for the center to do such things, and there should be disincentives if the center does it. So uh, an organization which has possibly a majority of state representation, which ensures that the center acts fairly with all the states, uh, sure. is the need of the art. Uh, Mr. Ghosh, let me take that up uh, with you as well. The point that uh, Mr. Hegde is making is that non-release of these funds hurts the prospects of the party in power in those states. Uh, just borrowing from the petition that Karnataka government has made, for instance, uh, they said that a high-level committee meeting is due from November of 2023. That high-level committee has not happened. That's the reason why we don't have 18,000 crore rupees, which we need uh, dramatically for our drought relief measures. Is there something to be said about the fact that uh, this petition comes just ahead of the Lok Sabha elections, that there has been a vacuum of sorts, uh, no decision being taken on the Karnataka demand for 18,000 crore rupees in the build-up uh, to the elections? Well, look here, I don't want to comment. Maybe this petition is also filed by the state for electoral purposes. But unfortunately, in this battle of political parties, and as I said, I don't hold the candle for any political party. In the battle of these political parties, it is the people who suffer. For example, you have the Mandrega dues of, uh, of workers in West Bengal. Now, you have the state ruling party fighting with the central party. And at the, in the end, this is not a good message being sent out either by the, uh, by the party in opposition or the party ruling in the center. However, you know, I have my doubts with regard to, you know, what my co respected co-panelists said, because these are all very, very, uh, you know, noble thoughts. You'll have a committee, they'll meet, etc. That hap doesn't happen like that. So, you know, at the end of the day, the power of the purse is with the center. And here you will have to have a central government, which at least at certain times will act beyond political considerations and electoral uh, maths. You know, at, at times you have to, you, you can't constantly be on an election mode. You have to always also understand that there are, you know, flood relief, drought relief. And, and please, and take this to your viewers. The first sentence of the petition has a very a legal, a Latin word, which is parents patrie. Of course, to, to translate for your uh, lay viewers, it, it means in the capacity as a parent. So what is, what is being said is that the central government is in the capacity of a parent to the states, and the state governments are in the capacity of a parent to its people. So, you know, let's all not do politics all the time. And this is not targeted against one party. It's, it, is, it is a sincere appeal of a common citizen to everyone, to all of the political parties. We're running out of time, so I'll just come to each of our guests for a brief comment on the way forward. Uh, the fact that this matter is before the top court. We've seen recently in the case of governors not agreeing to the state assembly actions. In those cases, we saw the state, uh, Supreme Court uh, use some very strong language uh, to rope in the conduct of the governors. 
Is that the need of the hour, that the Supreme Court now needs to set the House in order, especially on these fiscal matters, which involves release of funds from the centre to the states? Uh, quick comment by all of our panellists. Mr. Jain, to you first. Well, I think let's talk in the context of Vixit Bharat. I think if we want to develop India, it requires development of states and uniform development. So, as I suggested, that there must be objective and transparent criteria and speedy and timely decision making so that these issues are addressed through an institution mechanism. And yes, if that doesn't work, then as the Supreme Court expressed its concern today, that's why it's the last court and it's the arbiter. It can perhaps push parties to a decision or itself lay down a mechanism which will work across the board in all times to come rather than a state versus center issue. So that's the prerogative of the court and it has extraordinary powers to make sure that uh, this this can happen. Mr. Hegde, final comments. The Supreme Court flexed its muscles when it came to the governors. Does it time to flex its muscles once again? Well, uh, governors are single individuals and their role is very circumscribed by the Constitution. Here is a fiscal question and a political question. Often courts play safe. But if a court were to allow a state government in this situation, to sequester some of the funds, which it otherwise then transmits to the center, even when it collects it on the center's behalf, then maybe things can improve. Sure. Understood. Mr. Ghosh, final comments? Uh, the role you see the Supreme Court playing? Yes, the Supreme Court plays a crucial role. And it's time to hold governors accountable. In the Maharashtra Assembly case, the Supreme Court ultimately held that the governor was responsible for acting in an unconstitutional matter, manner. But unfortunately, uh, Governor Koshiari got away with nothing. So, you know, it is time when you put your, uh, you know, uh, uh, you, you have to put the house in order. You're not going to have these governors resign. We, we have uh, Those days are gone right. when governors will take moral responsibility and resign or accept uh, responsibility or the center will recall governors. So, unfortunately, we are left with the court and the court now has to right. come up with a, since, uh, a very, very uh, strict mechanism to hold these governors to account. Well, the Supreme Court has given the center to come back with a response in two weeks' time, especially with respect to the Karnataka government's demand for 18,000 crore rupees. I'd like to thank all of our guests uh, for joining us, Mr. Hegde, Mr. Jain, Mr. Ghosh. Thank you so much uh, for sharing your insights with us. And with that, it's a wrap on our special broadcast. More news and updates continue right here on CNBC TV 18.